Hello everyone, it's Rich Sheffrin and we are ready to get underway. And uh, right now I am sitting in my gym. That's where I am doing this live stream from. Uh, and I think I'm going to be doing quite a few out here. I've kind of situated my setup a little bit so that uh, it would be easier to do it from here than in the kitchen. And so what we're going to be talking about today are uh, mental models as we've been talking about it. But uh, you know, and I kind of take the concept of mental models as well as distinctions and I kind of bridge them together because uh, one helps you get ready for uh, the other, really. One, with distinctions, you create mental models. So they're one and the same. And I want to kind of talk about uh, at least two, maybe four. Uh, I call them the payoff fa fallacy, that's the first one. That's the primary one that I would say my coach kind of kicked my ass about. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you and hearing from you guys if you've kind of had this challenge as well. And so before we get underway, let me know where you're from. Let me know if you've been watching these Facebook Lives. Uh, if so, you know, do you like the Tuesday time better, the Thursday time better? But the more interaction we have, uh, the better it is for me uh, because it becomes less of a di uh, less of a monologue and more of a dialogue. So we're going to talk about the payoff fa fallacy. I also want to talk to you about uh, the what I call a strategy fallacy, but really it's the wrong way of looking at strategy. And a lot of people are guilty of making this mistake, and so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Uh, and then if we have time. Uh, that'll dovetail really well into a learning fallacy. And then if we have even more time, uh, we'll talk about a goal fallacy. And anything that we don't do today, we'll do next Tuesday. You know, I'm doing these twice a week. I'm doing them Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, and I'm doing it on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern. So I want to say hello to Bob Reese. I want to say hello to Matthew Sorrell and Mohammed and Syed and Al. Hopefully you now have audio. Uh, Christy, thank you for the compliment on the background. And uh, Al, the picture is a mismatch of colors. I'm not sure what you're talking about. It's just green and white as far as I can see. Uh, <laughs> ready for the goodness. Jim looks great. Thanks, Tom. Tom and I worked closely together for many years. Uh, Charlotte is from Greece. Uh, I'm glad that you can be here, Charlotte, uh, far away. And Victor is in Australia. Obviously, there are a lot more of you watching, and so I would love to hear uh, where you're from, if you'd be willing to entertain me on that. Uh, let's see. I want to close this. Also, while we're kind of getting geared up here, I do want to let you know about our Facebook group and uh, Puerto Rico. Thursdays are best from Kevin. So I want to tell you about our Facebook group, and I'm going to put this hopefully on the screen right now. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to do it later, I guess. And uh, all right. So also, I would love it if you guys could tell me, um, as we're talking about some of these, what the impact, if the impact has been for you. Hey, Oliver. Oliver is from New York City, but he lives in Italy. And... Uh, Renowned, is that how we say it? Renowned uh, from Amsterdam. So thank you. Thank you for sharing where you're from. Glad to have you guys here. Um, also wanted to play around with my iPhone. So I want to show you that uh, have this other, let's see, give you another view. Uh, but uh, obviously not the best view right now. I'm playing around with all these tools, trying to get a little bit better each time. And uh, so let's dive in, right? So when I was first starting out, you know, um, I was always and have always been very fascinated by leverage, you know, and I thought of leverage as getting the most from the least, right? How do you get the maximum payoff from the least amount of effort? Or how do you get more output from the same amount of effort? And, uh, you know, when I was in college, for example, I had a I had a comparative lit course and I had a philosophy course and I was able to convince both my philosophy professor and my comparative lit professor to accept the same essay. So I was able to spend one and a half times what I might spend on an essay, but use it for two classes. And that allowed me to, you know, do a little bit less, but get better grades in both. And uh, let's say hello to some other people. We've got Oyend. 
I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from Nigeria. Uh, you bought my BGS program in 2011. Very cool. Uh, Yolanda from Texas. Ed Sanchez. Uh, once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker, as I am, and I agree with that. So, you know, this idea of getting maximum payoff, and I, and that kind of carried forward, and it carried forward in a lot of things that I did, whether it was in the hypnosis business, or the fashion business, or the music business, but uh, it can be a blessing when handled correctly, but it can also be a curse when it is not handled correctly. So what I kind of started to think about was the opportunity in everything that I was doing and how I could get the maximum payoff from anything I was doing. So if I was invited on stage to speak somewhere, it was not only a chance to give a presentation, right? Uh, But it was a chance potentially to create a product. And because, you know, it's not every day that I'm in front of a big group of people. And so if I'm in front of a group of people, uh, that's going to be more powerful you know, with a good video team doing the shoot and all that kind of stuff, I could then turn that into a great product. And it would be, you know, me on stage, which is always better than just me in my gym. And and so because it was a product, though, then I'd have to spend a lot more time on it. And I went from thing to thing to thing, kind of always trying to get the most out of what I was doing. So you could say that what I was really focused on was the payoff of everything I was doing. What's the maximum payoff I can get from this? What's the maximum payoff I can get from that, right? And and this was like a mode of operating. And, you know, I, I've never made it a secret that I have ADD. And I remember, you know, reading that first book that I read on ADD, which was Driven to Distraction by John Brady and Ned Hallowell. And, uh, you know, after that book impacted me a great deal. And about a year and a half later, I had... Uh, I had gotten myself an ADD coach. Her name was Nancy Rady, who used to be the wife. At that time, she was the wife of John Rady. And I guess like about a decade later, John Rady was my uh, psych- ADD psychiatrist for a little while as well. So I've kind of, yeah, they were already divorced at that point. But so Nancy was my coach. And uh, I was behind on a bunch of stuff. And she asked me why. And I was preparing a presentation. I don't remember where for where. Um, might have been for big seminar at the time or some place. And, uh, and she said, well, why, what's taking you so long on this presentation? And I was explaining to her, well, you know, I can turn it into a product. And so I'm, I've been doing a lot of research because I want this to be a great product. And, you know, and I went into a 10 minute conversation about all the things that I could get out of this presentation. And uh, that would be a product and would be potentially uh, something that we could sell well. And if people bought it and I did a good job, then they'd be more likely to buy other stuff and so on and so forth. And, you know, she stopped me during the conversation and she said, Rich, you know, sometimes a presentation is I'm going to curse for a second. So I apologize if I offend anyone. But Rich, a present sometimes a presentation is just a fucking presentation. It's not a product. It's not you know, your way of being seen by the world. It's not, you know, the 20 other things that I had defined it as. And what I recognized in that conversation, and it was a game-changing conversation for me, is that I had always been focused on the payoff of things, but very rarely did I focus on the trade-off of things. So payoff versus trade-off. Let me know if that makes sense for you. And if it does make sense for you, tell me, if you've ever been guilty of focusing on the payoff and maybe not put enough focus on the trade-off, there's a trade-off in everything that we do. And, you know, part of being successful is more about saying no to many things. So you can say yes to the few things. And so when we focus on payoff to the detriment of not focusing enough on the trade-off, what we end up doing is seeing opportunity everywhere and oftentimes causing a great amount of havoc in our life. So let me know if this resonates because I want to take this further, but if it doesn't, I can just jump into something else. Um, It's important for me to know how that kind of lands for you. You know, does that make sense? One, and if so, have you ever been guilty of the same? 
because if you if you've been guilty of it, um, you know that's actually in some ways a good thing, because what it shows is is that you're focused on getting leverage. But if you're constantly focused on getting leverage, and you know without the corresponding force of looking at trade-offs, then you more often than not are neglecting things that are important, but maybe not urgent. You are uh, causing a tremendous amount of stress in your life. And so that kind of thinking for entrepreneurs can be very dangerous. The, you know, everything has the potential to be so much more, but at what cost? And this concept of trade-off versus payoff, I think really kind of dovetails into a lot of areas of our life, right? Um, there's a trade-off, right? Like if we go out and have a great time with friends, the payoff is a great time. The trade-off is, is that maybe the next day we're a little bit more ragged than we normally are. And I would say that pretty consistently in my life until I had this kind of distinction kind of smacked me in the face by my coach, Nancy Rady, um, I always looked at the payoff. I always looked at what something could be, whether it was business, personal, what have you. And very often didn't think about what sacrifices would need to be made. I don't remember who said it, but someone very smarter than me said, every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no or maybe or later to everything else. And that's a good way also of kind of keeping yourself in check. You know, there's lots of things that I would be interested in learning and it would be great if I knew those things. But if I spent the time learning those things, I wouldn't necessarily have the time to spend learning other things. So in addition to that, as we kind of go further on this, um, I'd love it. I'd love to know if anyone struggles to this day with something like this. And if so, potentially where and how and why so that I can help you kind of get better at understanding what the um, what the trade-off versus the payoff is. Uh, oh, thank you, Troy, for letting others know about this and anyone else that is willing to tell their friends, uh, post it to a group or what have you. I really appreciate that. Uh, sometimes we'll have contests, sometimes we won't. I was thinking, uh, oh, I brought them into the other room, didn't I? Yeah. I want to give away a couple t-shirts. Um, I don't know that I'm going to do it today, though. Um, if you're not a member of our group, you should be. It's called the Conversion Club Group, and it's myself, plus a lot of heavy-duty marketers, plus a lot of Agora insiders, and we're all very active in that group, and it's a great place to post. It's free, and it's a great place, place to post either questions that you have, advice for others that you have, et cetera. And it's called the Conversion Club Group. And uh, we always announce all of these live streams way ahead in advance there as well. So let's kind of see what kind of feedback we're getting here. All right. So Robert said, yes, I'm scattered like that often. I hear you. Christy said, totally true. So focused on the payoff, I end up bogged down and end up not doing it at all. Or you do a, a crappy job. You know, um, I'll tell you about another time in my life that it didn't work out very well. Uh, Dennis said yes and yes. Uh, Kevin says it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Troy shared this live stream with others. So I really appreciate you, Troy. Uh, Oliver said, actually, I'm often focused on unimportant things like aesthetics instead of getting value. And I go on spirals down that path, wasting time. So trade-off takes a hit for egotistical purposes. You know, I'm, I've been guilty of that myself, Oliver. Uh, I read this one book, uh, I think it's called Invisible Commitments uh, by Robert Kagan. And there's an exercise that you go through that it's like, what should you be doing? What's the goal? What should you be doing? What are you doing instead? And then it looks at, well, when you do those things instead, why would you do those things? Like, what benefit do you get from that? And then what kind of person would choose those benefits over the goal? And what I came to was that I didn't really like myself. I'm not saying that you'd come to that same outcome. Uh, but at the time when I did that and went through that book, I recognized that I didn't like myself that much and that what I was doing was causing me to like myself more, but at the expense of achieving a bunch of goals and it was pretty nasty. And so if it's consistently a problem, Oliver, I would, uh, I would, or Olivier, 
I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, and I apologize. Uh, I would check out Robert Kagan. He's a professor at Harvard on adult uh, learning, which is more about transformational stuff as far as shifting the way you see the world and uh, Invisible Commitments or something to that effect was the name of that book, and it was extremely powerful. Uh, all right. Hey, Rich, what is your life or business purpose, and how did you discover it? Well, all right, so let's talk about that for a second, and then I'll get back to my story. Um, so uh, whew, I've had an interesting childhood, and you know, for some of you who've seen some of the podcast interviews about me, uh, then you might have heard some of it and not necessarily going to go into the details of those stories now. Um, but, you know, my childhood had me uh, had me my childhood intersected with uh, the movie Goodfellas. It was based on a book called Wise Guys. And actually, the people that I knew were in the book, but not in the movie. And then a high school job had me. Uh, I was working at a brokerage firm called Investment Center, and that was the very first brokerage firm that Jordan Belford, the Wolf of Wall Street, worked at. Uh, so my childhood is Goodfellas plus the Wolf of Wall Street. Those are two of the things that my life intersected with. Uh, oftentimes also, people are kind of uh, amazed or shocked at how long I can go without sleep or focused or working out for long periods of time. And that's partly... Um, in all those areas, it's a strength, but it's, it's, um, it's caused by, um, trauma. Uh, I'm somewhat more in my head than in my body and somewhat disconnected from my body. And so that allows me to be able not to, on the good side, not to allow tiredness and other things interfere with me as much as it often interferes with others on the, on the negative side. It also has me uh, not as in touch with my emotions as probably most people are. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of journaling, because it's through journaling oftentimes that I get clear about what I'm truly feeling. So that all leads to this other thing, which was I was um, locked in a room for a period of time in my childhood. Uh, and I really did not feel free to express myself without going into a crazy amount of details. And so for me, entrepreneurship is not only your chance to really be as close to God as possible. And I don't mean like knowing God or anything like that, but to be God like, because you have the ability to create, create a living, breathing thing that can live without you. But in addition to that, it's also a place where you are free to self-express. And that's one of the reasons why I tell entrepreneurs they need to build the business around their flaws so it can be successful based on who they are today and et cetera. And so I felt as a child that I wasn't free to express who I truly was. And that desire for myself is also channeled into my purpose, which is to help others get to that place where they're free to self-express. What I found also is, is that the most powerful purposes that entrepreneurs often find for themselves are something that was deprived of them at some early stage of life that they're able to tap into because it creates a tremendous force, a, tr a tremendous amount of power um, because it's not, it lives deep within you. And so I kind of discovered that over time over self, you know, introspection, uh, retrospection, uh, going to transformation courses, psychologists. Um, I've done a lot of work. I've needed a lot of work. Um, <laughs> um, so I came across it that way and I, and I recognized how much more power there is for me in something like that, because I know what it feels like not to have that. And that knowing of what it feels like not to have it, makes me want to have it for everyone. And so that's, I think if more entrepreneurs looked deeper into their past as to what they felt they were missing, what they felt deprived of, what they were robbed of, what, what stood in their way and can build a bridge from that to what they've often done, uh, they will see a pattern there that they didn't know existed. So that's, I know I went a little bit off track there, but uh, hopefully that was helpful for people. 
Um, I think if anyone takes the time and actually really thinks about what I just said and applies it to their own life and they're able to kind of figure that part out, um, they will be very appreciative because like I said, um, and I've said a gazillion times, the greatest productivity secret in the world is to be extremely passionate about what you do. And one of the ways that you can tap into such a tremendous amount of passion is being clear about something that has impacted you in a far more serious way uh, than most things can, right? Um, so I would say that. Uh, okay, let's see. Michelle Tui, I'm good at researching and listening, not good at applying and converting. So kind of the opposite of what you're saying. Not necessarily, Michelle. Um, the, you know, the issue there is, let's see, where can I put this there? I can put it up here, I think. Uh, the issue there is, Mm -mm. There we go. Um, what is driving you to do all that research and to do all that listening? And, you know, for me, I, I also do a lot of that. For me, it's more a function of being a perfectionist. A perfectionist, you know, there's this great quote. Don't remember where I read it. But perfectionism is trying to get the world to believe something about you that you don't believe about yourself. And so I've often felt like who I am and the value I, I as a person is based on what I do, not who I am, like, or, you know, just as a human being. And when someone thinks like that, uh, oftentimes then what they do and how good of a job they do is then equated with their self-worth. And when that's the case, then everything has to be done at an impeccable level because you're defining who your self-worth in everything that you do. And so I know for me, the amount of research, the amount of thinking, and the amount of like off input, let's just say input, um, is was and still is less to a less degree today, but um, I wouldn't say that, you know, I've got it all figured out, um, is it still sits with me. And, you know, I wrote a, a blog post a gazillion years ago um, called Decrease the Input, Increase the Output. Uh, a lot of times, researching more, listening more, reading more is a, is a cop-out for doing your own thinking. And it's also an avoidance strategy of doing your own thinking and of your own creating. So those are just some thoughts about it. Uh, hopefully they help. But... Um, the the other thing is what I would say, Michelle, is that when you come across something powerful, you should stop right then and there and 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 then go with the desire to share that. So one of my mentors, Mark Ford, Michael Masterson, uh, one of the feedback, one of the positive feedbacks he gave me when I wrote the manifesto, he said, um, you know, this is a copywriting trick, but I don't get that. It's a, you did it as a copywriting trick because I'm not that good of a copywriter, but, um, but he said, when I read it, it felt like I was reading something by someone who discovered a secret, who was really excited to share it. And, and there was a lot of truth to that. That's part of, you know, what the manifesto was. These were secrets I discovered that I would talk to anyone about. And so what I'm saying here is that when you're doing your research, when you're doing your listening, if you can stop yourself, once you find something powerful and then use that urge of that powerful thing to share it. I find for myself that often helps me get into action a lot faster and also put my other stuff aside. I've also, you know, Michelle, um, I think someone who's really good at kind of making this distinction even better than I can is Katrina Ruth, the woman that I did the last two live streams with, because, you know, um, I've always, I was a fat as a kid. And so I'm, I've always been afraid of being fat again. And I got fat when I first got online, I was 250 pounds. And, uh, and so I work out not necessarily to be in the shape I am in because I'm in really good shape, but I'm, I work out so I don't get fat. That's, you know, still that fear sits in the back of my head. And so, uh, I have a rule with myself that I will always work out, but I don't always feel like working out, which means sometimes I might only work out for a couple minutes. And that's the rule I have that no matter how I feel, it doesn't really matter because generally once I get on the elliptical machine, 
uh, once I'm on for five minutes, I feel great. And, but there are certain days where I don't feel great. And if I get on and I get off, that's fine. I, I lived up to my agreement. It never occurred to me to follow that strategy in any other area of my life other than working out. And when I was having a, when I did an interview with Katrina, uh, for steal our winners, we, we went into that, not about that specifically, but you know, she said it, she, it in the moment, it didn't matter if, whether she felt like writing or not, that she would start writing. And that was the agreement she had with herself. And she'd start, she would write for five minutes and then she would make the decision because oftentimes our feelings are kind of conveniently lie to ourselves to get us to avoid things that might be unpleasant to start. And, uh, and so it occurred to me, yeah, that I had never thought about that as it occurred to related to writing or in other areas of my life, but yet for working out, it somehow did and how powerful and effective it was. And, you know, Katrina also said, it doesn't really matter if you can be better tomorrow by what you learned today, you still have a job to do today and you got to get that job done. And the job as an entrepreneur, especially, uh, is on the output side, not on the input side more often than not. So I hope that helps Michelle. Let's kind of go a little bit further here. How do you approach leadership, set up and lead a team? What are the best resources about leadership that you have been exposed to? Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a great leader. Um, although one of the things that's always impacted me is something. <clears throat> I think it was Tracy Goss. I think that's her name. Something Goss. Um, said something about leadership, which was the goal of leadership is to make something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. Uh, if something's going to happen anyway, then it doesn't, you don't need a leader, right? So the purpose of a leader is to make something happen that wasn't going to happen. And, uh, and I found in my life that I am extremely motivated by a very capable and dynamic team. So my first group of management, like my first management team, when I had, when I was in the fashion business were amazing people. Uh, Troy White, Jay Sternstein, Frank uh, Frank Pizzo. Yep. Frank Pizzo, uh, Paul Maggot. And, uh, they all went on to much bigger and better things after we went our separate ways. Uh, Frank became president of retailing for diesel. Um, Troy became someone very high up in Levi's for a while. Jay was running Mew Mew and Prada's like wholesale division in the United States at one point. And, I was very fortunate. I just had a really good team and, and, and I, I excelled because I had a really good team. I didn't realize how lucky I was because that was my first business I really ran. And, um, recently at Agora, and I don't say this to disparage anyone, so I'm not going to like say names, but when I first got there, I was in one division, then I moved to another division. And while I was in the first division and I'm not the leader, I'm just a guru for Agora. Um, I thought I was depressed, uh, but what I realized was only later on, like I thought I was really depressed. I was actually somewhat concerned about myself. And uh, what I realized later on was when I moved to a different team uh, that worked at a much faster clip, a much more energetic pace where there was lots more going on and the people just were more enthusiastic that I didn't feel depressed anymore. And I was talking to a former employee of mine uh, someone who I have a lot of respect for, Alan Kay, uh, this morning. And I was telling him about that. And he's like, hey, you always knew that. And maybe I did and maybe I didn't, or maybe I forgot it. Um, he's like, you absorb the energy of good people around you, but you absorb the energy of bad people around you. That's kind of who you are. And so I find it very easy to lead a good team, but I'm not so easy to lead a bad team. I also think, though, that leadership at the end of the day is a battle of wills. Um, it's a question of whose will is going to win sometimes because there are things that are going to need, need to be done that people might not want to do. And, um, and therefore it's going to be your will against their will. And I find a lot of entrepreneurs back off of that. And that's never a good thing. I'd also say though, that every time I've done something large, it's been about something much bigger than myself. And if you think about I think many people look at great people 
and think somehow, some way, those people are different. And I think in a lot of ways, that's a cop out because they behave differently, but are they different? And I think one of the secrets to being a great leader is to have a cause that's bigger than yourself. I am sure that there were days that Martin Luther King had a headache, didn't feel like going on a march, didn't feel like giving a speech, but it didn't matter how he felt because he was committed to a cause bigger than himself. When you're committed to a cause that is about yourself, like making more money or being more successful or being seen as more successful or being more respected, then when you don't want to work, when you don't feel like working, it's it's on parts. It's the same level, right? Whereas when you're committed to a cause that's bigger than yourself, it pulls greatness out of you. So I've always tried to instill in what I do a bigger cause than myself, to make a bigger difference than what I myself could do. And that's why I was creating a company. And I have found that um, the better I'm able to do that for myself to cause greater a greater Rich Sheffern to show up, um, it also has an impact on everyone else around me. And when I haven't, I, I also haven't, like when I haven't done that, I also haven't, uh, I haven't increased the level of performance around, around me either. So I'd say that that's probably, if there was one thing that I could share about leadership, it would be commit to a cause bigger than yourself because it creates an entirely different context for yourself and for all those around you and recognize that your goal as a leader is to make something happen that wouldn't happen anyway, because there is no purpose of, for a leader to just make what's going to be the default future happen. So what is the future that you're committed to, to make happen that is bigger than yourself that would not happen unless you and a bunch of other people come together to make it happen. And I think that raises everyone's performance, including the leader. So hopefully that helps Battis. I hope it does. Um, going to get back to my story at some point. Um, but I enjoy answering questions. It's actually easier for me. Uh, oh, I got to, I, maybe I'll move it back down here. Just having a hard time placing this where I can kind of not box people out, but also I can be seen. Um, maybe if I move this down here, sorry guys, move this up here. All right. Uh, as a software builder, I recognize the feeling to keep on building on the product, always adding functionality to build a product that can be used in multiple markets, but maybe you don't mean this. Well, this relates back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's what I mean or not. And um, what I would say is, is that, you know, the trade-off is there that maybe you're not building the best thing for one market. And so you have this tool that is good, but could be great if it was more focused, right? And, you know, one of the things that I think about business is that when you're building a business, really what you're doing is you're building a system to get an outcome for your customers. And so like when you look at, and this is an old kind of example, but I think it's one of the best ones, is that when you look at um, the difference between Blockbuster and Netflix, Blockbuster and Netflix were serving the same outcome, home entertainment of like recent movies or old movies, right? But the system for Netflix is superior because the customer had to do less. And so your business is a system to get an outcome and the entrepreneur or the software designer or whatever business someone's in um, that designs a better system for their customer. In other words, the customer has to do less. The customer has to pay less. The customer gets the result faster. Um, whatever it is, um, is building a better system. And so long term, the better system wins. Short term, it can be a lot about, mar well, I'd say long term, most of the time, the better system wins, right? There's like Betamax versus VHS and 
that was a distribution issue more than anything else. But more often than not, the better system wins. And so, you know, is your system just good for all these markets or could it be great? And if it was great, would it eclipse someone else? And that's not an answer. That's not a question you need to answer for me. That's just more question that I'm throwing out there for you. Richard Kent, I have and appreciate your BGS program. Are you doing any further work within it? Yeah, actually, um, I'm, we're totally updating it. So we've cut it up into pieces, which then makes it easier for me to attack different. We're taking each module and turning it into lots of different cut ups. And uh, so it's not one long two hour thing. It's more like maybe 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 15 or 20 minute ones. And then that allows me to update my knowledge and add more to it. And we're working on that as I speak. So hopefully, uh, Richard, you'll see that at some point. Um, Michelle said, me too. So I assume that's about, uh, you know, doing too much input versus output. Uh, Victor Little, I love doing the technical and saying to myself, if I just create this, then I can sell a, my product better, but it equals no sales. Right. Uh, this is something I learned from Dan Kennedy a long time ago. It's not the best technician that makes the most money. It's the best marketer of that technical skill that makes the most money. So it's not the best coach that makes the most, most money. It's the best marketer of coaching that makes the best, most money. And so unless that technical, whatever you're doing on the technical side can translate, um, then oftentimes there's a price to be paid. None of this is, I, I don't see any of what I'm saying now in conflict with the better system, right? Um, part of a better system is being able to market it. But what I have found, and I think, I think I'm a good illustration of this, is to use the most compelling or the most sexy, for lack of a better word of describing it, concepts that I've come across in what I learned about business or what I learned about coaching to excite others to then want to do business with me. So you could say that when I was studying what I studied so I could know more about business or I could be a better coach, that I wasn't only doing those things so I could do those things, but I had an eye out for spotting those things that got me excited that I could then share with others. You know, one of the ways that I like to talk about marketing to someone who doesn't get it, right? Or to someone new to marketing or someone who I just feel could benefit from this distinction is, is that like there was a time when I knew that everyone in internet marketing would do better and make more money if they, if they knew more about business, right? But no one else knew that and no one else believed that or thought that. And so one of the things about marketing is recognizing that I didn't come to that belief by accident. And I didn't come to be a business coach or consultant or strategic marketing, whatever, uh, by accident. Like I came to those things because I had a number of experiences that had led me to the conclusion that this is important and it's important for me. And if other people knew it, it would be important for them. So I'm, but I'm talking to a group of prospects that have not had those experiences. So they have not come to those conclusions. So one way of looking at marketing is to clarify what led you to the conclusion. Why do you believe in what you sell? And hopefully it's not that because you sell it, hopefully you believed in it before you sold it. And if that's the case, then what were those things that led you to those beliefs? Because if you can clarify that, then your goal or one like conceptual way of looking at the marketing task at hand is to give your prospects that experience, an abbreviated, you know, accelerated version of those experiences that leads them to the same conclusion. And so one way of looking at the manifesto, right, the Internet Business Manifesto, my first report that was downloaded millions and millions of times um, was my like the things I had come across that blew me away in their power and had convinced me that everyone who knew these things would make money more easily online. And when I shared it, it had the same impact on others so that they came to that same conclusion as well. Um, so I hope that helps, Victor. 
Do, 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 do. This is fun. I hope everyone's having fun. Let me know if you're having fun. Tell me, give me some feedback here if you want me to get back to my stories or if you're also learning from these answers. I never know, you know, um, so it's always useful. Uh, I have a successful offline. So this is Kevin. I have a successful offline business. I'm uh, sorry. I have a successful offline service business that finds customers online. My current struggle is that I have at least a dozen different projects that are highly likely to increase revenue. But I find myself bouncing from one project to another rather than focusing on one until it's done. As a result, it takes much longer to get completion and implementation on any given project. You know what? This is a perfect time to give you guys an example if I can figure out a way to do this. And I think I can. So I'm going to see if I can use my camera, a different, my different camera, and see if I can. This is something that I taught years ago. Um, and I have a solution to, for it for you, Kevin, but I want to see first if I can do this in a way that will, uh, help. So let's see, I'm trying to, let's see, can I, let's take a look at these cameras. Cool. I think this might work. I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to put this right here for a second and no, that's not going to do it unless I can. Uh, sorry, guys. Just bear with me one second. There we go. Okay. And hopefully <laughs> I'm experimenting. I apologize. I shouldn't probably do this while I'm doing a live stream, but um, I think you guys know I have the best. I have your best interest at heart. I really do. Um, all right. Let's see. Okay. There we go. That kind of works. All right. So let's put this here. And cool. All right. So and now I'm going to move yours to the bottom here. Well, I'm going to close this and I'm going to Kevin. Uh, so this way I have the biggest screen possible and I'm just going to see where things stop. Okay. So it stops there. And then we're at, let's see, we're going to stop right here. All right. And then, okay. So, the problem with doing too many projects, right? And the way I like to think about it is, let's say that you're working on three projects. Um, so you're working on three projects and it's A. Oh, you know what? I got to do it the other way around. Okay, hold on a second. Sorry. Uh, it's going to throw everything off. Let's see. You know what? I'll just hold. Yeah, I don't think I can hold it. All right. I'm going to put this up for a second. And we're going to do it this way. All right. Uh, um, all right. Almost there, guys. Sorry. All right. There we go. All right. So you got, let's say you have three projects and each project is a letter, right? So you have A, B, and C. And each box is a week. So you spent one week on A, one week on B, one week on C. And let's say that all projects require three weeks, uh, nine weeks, all right? So we'd have three A's, three B's, three C's, okay? Well, when you follow this road, right, you finish project A, one, two, three, right? And you have two weeks where it's actually been in the nine weeks that it's actually been useful, right? And you have one week where B is useful, right? And zero weeks where C is useful. Now, whenever you do a project in business, it's because you believe you're going to make more money. Every project at the end of the day relates to making more money. Business is in, the, you're in the game of making more money. And therefore, you only take on projects that in some way, shape, or form are tied to making more money. Even if that project is installing better customer service programs, it's because you believe you'll hold on to customers longer. So what happens, though, is that when you're monofocused, right, and you work on one at a time, right, so it's A, 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 B, B, B. C, C, C. Now you get the payoff from A for six weeks, right? 
get the payoff from B for three weeks, and C is always zero. So here you get nine weeks of payoff over these nine weeks. Here you get three. The challenge is, is that most entrepreneurs don't just do this. But the first week, it's the first three weeks, it's A, B, C, and then they add a D here, right? So now it's, and now it's A, B, C, D, E, and they're always adding more product projects, which means, and this is kind of what I was saying earlier, that every time you say yes to another project, you're saying later to every other project. And that's, I wrote about that, I believe, in the entrepreneurial emergency. So uh, if that's appealing or interesting to you, uh, it was a free report I wrote called The Entrepreneurial Emergency, and you could read about it there. Um, the other thing that I found, and I learned this from Telman Knutson, and so props to Telman. Uh, pro uh, he has ADD, as I do. And what maybe one of the reasons that you jump from project to project is because you, whether you have ADD or you have ADD tendencies, you like the variety. And what Telman told me years ago, which always stuck with me, is that, you know, you can break up a project into multiple parts. So you can still have the variety of jumping around, but you're jumping around within one project as opposed to jumping around um, from different projects to different projects. You get the same dopamine fix, you get the same variety mix, but you don't fall victim to the ABC issue. Is that cool, Kevin? Let me know if you dig that. And if you do, I would appreciate you telling others about this live stream. All right, Richard Kent, uh, how do I journal? You should know this, Richard. I wrote a whole report called The Hidden Obstacles to Success. That is not a free report, although I'm sure it can be found. Um, and it was a how I think. And I, because I come from a place where I think most people don't think. And thinking isn't easy. And if you don't make the time for thinking, then it doesn't just happen. So I use my journal to think, to figure stuff out. And it's always near me. Um, here, I've been using the same, whoop, sorry about that. I just lost my picture for a second. I'm sure I'm still on now. I've been using the same type of journal uh, for God knows how many years, over 25 now. And uh, each one has 200 pages. I have at least 30 of these in my safe. Um, I don't know if I'm going to burn them after I, uh, I can't really, I don't know if it's not really safe to show anyway, uh, cause God knows what I, I, I'm totally real in my journal, which was news to me that other people aren't. Uh, cause I asked some friends of mine who keep a journal. I'm like, what are you going to do with your journals when you die? And they're like, Oh, I'll give it to my family. I'm like, aren't you afraid of what they're going to find? And they're like, Oh, I don't write any of that stuff in my journal. I'm like, Oh, well, I write everything in my journal, my thoughts about people that change from, you know, time to time, like to what I think about myself to just everything. Uh, but that's where I do my thinking. I do my thinking in my journal. Um, I keep track of certain things in my journal, um, the things that I want to remain conscious, conscious to. But the hidden obstacles of success, I wrote like, I think at least 20 or 30 pages of all the different ways that I use my journal. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me conscious. I, th I don't know if it's an ADD thing. I don't know if it's like the trauma shit from my past, but I find it very easy if I'm not grounded on a daily basis to like have a week or two go by and have really no idea what did I do for those two weeks. I mean, not that I don't remember, like I didn't black out, but that I was like completely unconscious of what was important to me, what I was trying to get done. Like I just lost track of stuff. And so the journal is also my way of doing that. I use a lot of sentence stems to force me to kind of do certain types of thinking. And I answer questions. Um, I'm a big fan of collecting questions. Like when I read books, I learned that from Stephen Pierce, uh, the first person that I really learned internet marketing from. He was a collector of questions. Um, so I do the same. And I find questions to be very valuable because they steer thinking. And, um, and so that's how I use my journal. Uh, oh, wow. We were far behind. Free to self-express entrepreneurship. Wow, Rich. Cool. I'm glad you like that, uh, Rodney. Uh, Jams, thanks for being so open, Rich. Uh, my pleasure. Well, you know, I, as I was talking about in the live streams I did with Katrina, that two of the people that I have the most that I, I enjoy, well, three people I enjoy the most, right? Like watching their stuff. Uh, two are people I'm very close with. One, 
I don't know very well, uh, is Wes Watson on YouTube, uh, Penitentiary Life. Uh, he spent 10 years in the, in the California State Penitentiary. He was the head of the white gang, and uh, he's a close friend, and, uh, but one of the most authentic people I know. And, uh, and I aspire to be like him in many ways. And not to have his past, but <laughs> uh, to be like him now. And one of the things that he is above everything is authentic. And I feel the same way about Katrina Ruth, the, the uh, woman slash guru that I just did the last two live streams with. And then Joe Rogan is another person who I think is extremely authentic. And so I'm trying to do a better job myself of being more open, less guarded about what I share. I've always kind of overshared, but there have been areas of my life that I didn't share. And I'm trying to share more because I really enjoy live streams a lot. And I feel that if I could connect better with people, if people got more value from it, and it could become a more essential element of my business. And I don't believe that I'm there yet, but part of getting there is doing, is practice. And so um, this is my practice. And it's my practice in getting better on camera, but it's also uh, my practice in getting myself to open up more, not about sad stories and not about like, you know, poor me, but in ways that I can share a story about my life that helps other people. And if it does, then that's great because that's what I'm attempting to do. You know, there's not a lot of people who I listen to when, when they say something, I believe 100% that they believe it, but Joe Rogan, Wes Watson, Katrina Ruth, all three of them, if they say something, I am certain that they believe it. They might be wrong, but they believe it. And, um, I'm a skeptical person, I guess, by nature. And, uh, and to, so when that, when someone seems authentic to me, I can let my guard down and I'm more comfortable and therefore I can enjoy whatever it is even more so. Um, so that's hopefully explains that Rodney, uh, Michelle, uh, you write your day in any notebook, your thoughts, feelings, how you handle a situation of both good and hard things you did or encounter in your day, you can brainstorm how you can do better. Yeah. And sometimes like just to get at what I feel, you know, um, Kim and I were having an argument and I knew that like, I wanted more from her, but I also knew that she was going through a situation herself. And so I needed to kind of get at like what she must be feeling, what I'm feeling. Um, how could I look at it different? How could she look at it different? I remember when I, my psychologist that I used to go to in Florida, um, I was like, you know, I've read a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy. Maybe we should try that. And she's like, oh, we should not try that. She's like, your whole journal is cognitive behavioral therapy. So I'm constantly looking at situations, reevaluating them, determining whether I acted appropriately or not. And there are many times I don't and what I can learn from it and how maybe next time I won't make that same mistake. Can you speak to building a business around your innate weakness? Um, it's not building a business around your innate weakness. It's building a business to make your flaws not, no longer relevant. So what I find, so like, you know, it's, uh, so what's one of the cool things about these Facebook lives is that um, I've had a bunch of clients of mine who I haven't spoken to in 15 years kind of swing by. And a lot of them would tell you that like a lot of the stuff that I taught back then was stuff that they hadn't heard anywhere else. And nowadays you hear a lot of that stuff elsewhere. So I think I was one of the, I was very early. I wasn't the first, I'm sure, but I was very early in the idea of building a business around your strengths. I was very early in talking about what blue oceans are and creating a category of one. Um, you know, these are much more common things nowadays, but one of the things that I haven't seen really knocked off by anyone um, is this idea of building a business around your flaws. And maybe it's because, you know, maybe it's because a lot of people aren't necessarily comfortable admitting their flaws, but I find that most entrepreneurs, not all the time, maybe 85% of the time, maybe 90% of the time when I'm speaking to an entrepreneur and they feel like they're disappointing their business, like they're not doing certain things more often than not, 
85, 90% of the time, it's because they design their business incorrectly. They design their business on some mythical entrepreneur, some perfect entrepreneur, or some entrepreneur they hope to be one day, as opposed to who they are. And so I was very clear that I am more flawed than the average person. Um, I am a gifted underachiever. I'm certainly not an overachiever. And so, you know, I procrastinate, I'm flaky, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I got all this baggage, right? And I needed to figure out a way that a business could succeed with someone like me running the business. And instead of me hoping that I'd be different, because personal change is hard work uh, when they're like personality and character issues. And, you know, I remember the book, I, I think this was over a decade ago, it might have even been longer, Change or Die. And that book was about, you know, when people are faced with the decision that they have to change their lifestyle or they'll die, 90% die. We all would like to think that we would change, but 90% of people like who have a quadruple bypass do not change, they die. And so that's how hard personal change is. And so even before that though, I felt like, if you make, if, if in order for your business to be successful, you have to achieve some personal success, you've just pushed out the timeline of your business success. So, you know, how did I build a business being a perfectionist and a procrastinator, right? And really you could take the procrastination out because even the perfectionism would turn me into a procrastinator from the standpoint that it never mattered when I started something, I finished it at the very last moment. And if you look at like how I rose and how I grew my business, I grew my business by writing reports that changed people's perspectives about things and then sold a live coaching program behind it. Every time I would not finish the presentation for the modules or for whatever I was doing until moments before I went live. And there have been quite a few times when I've spoken on stage where while I am walking to stage, I am still adjusting like a PowerPoint slide or two. I don't, it's not something I like about myself. I often would love to have something done way ahead of time. And sometimes I get there, but more often than not, I don't. And had I built a business where I created programs in isolation and then I was to re reveal them to the world, I don't know that I would have ever been successful. So that's one example. And I've given other examples during some of the other live streams. So I'm not going to go through them all. But my experience is, is that if you're, you as the entrepreneur feel like you're disappointing your business, the majority of the time, it's because that business was not designed properly around who you are. And when you change the design of the business and you're free to be who you are and the business succeeds anyway, um, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be a cakewalk, you know, like it just means that you have outthought your flaws in advance. And you will not allow the business to be handicapped by your flaws. And when you do that, you no longer disappoint your business. You become more successful and you can then decide to change who you are. But at least your financial success, your family's security financially isn't banking on that. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from when I talk about designing a business to make your flaws irrelevant not necessarily to capitalize on your weaknesses, but to make your flaws irrelevant. And that's very different than just building a business on your strengths. Building a business on your strengths is whatever comes easy to you to create value for others. Like that's what you should be doing. But that doesn't mean that like you just minimize your weaknesses. It means getting clear about what your weaknesses are, where you've consistently disappointed yourself or others, and then figuring out a way where the business isn't impacted when you do what it is you normally do. I hope that helps, uh, Stuart. Cool. Uh, anything you can put your feelings down and be better. Yeah, totally. That's that's just one area that I use my business, like my journal for, but thinking about business, thinking about my future, thinking about my kids, thinking about how difficult that sometimes in their lives are so I can have more empathy, uh, things like that. Uh, thanks for sharing real soul searcher in the middle of that process. Great. Can you like phonetically write out how I pronounce your name? Is it Renaud? Is that how I do it? I'm just, I have no idea. And I feel bad that I keep 
butchering it. Uh, oh, cool. Charlotte says, loved our conversation with Katrina Ruth about authenticity. Glad. Okay. Makes complete sense. Cool. Yes, I feel things just like that. Cool. Uh, it drives me crazy. Overactive brain. I relate to that. Thank you. Katrina Ruth is awesome. Yeah, she is awesome. No doubt about it. I'm a fan. And uh, she's a grand guru, right? Like from a standpoint that Yara Starrick was a client of mine. Katrina Ruth was a client of his. Um, I have a lot of grand gurus and great grand gurus. Uh, um, uh, awesome inner structure sharing that gets to uncovering our divine. Yeah, I would say that. Yep, a leader is a catalyst for change. To make a future that wasn't going to happen anyway is the way I said it. Uh, have a cause bigger than yourself. Yep. Willpower. To, to live ever learning the will. I don't know if I agree with that or not. Um, it definitely takes some willpower to choose the right thing in the moment. But I would say that if you rely too much on willpower, then it speaks to not being completely aligned that you should look forward to doing the most important things in your business. And if you're not, it opens up a question, but it, that also, I guess, depends on what your philosophy of life is. You know, I'm not a very religious person. I went for those, most people wouldn't know this, I guess I was, I was raised Jewish and I was, I actually went to yeshiva where you study the Torah for four hours a day. Um, and I am not religious at all. Um, agnostic if not atheist and so i really believe that you live life once and any place that you settle in life is like you just stop growing and there's like that's it and i want to experience as much as i can and i want to like ups and downs um and so to dedicate your life to a business that doesn't that requires you to will it like to means that it's not pulling you forward you're pushing it forward and i wouldn't want to do that for too long that doesn't mean that in the beginning to get like that initial momentum there might need to be a push but i really a lot of the things that steve jobs said in that commencement address he did at stanford um ring true to me and while i, I wouldn't say that like if i look myself in the mirror and say like if today was my last day would i want to be doing this um, and if I do that a few days, I know it's time to go, but I would say that I have done that. I've done that numerous times. That's why I left the fashion business. That's why I left the music business. It's part of the reason why I left the hypnosis business. It's the reason I took five years off from internet marketing. Um, I don't want to do the things that I, life is too precious and I don't want to spend any of it, um, doing things that I don't believe in, don't feel great about, feel like that I have to force myself to do. Um, it's just not worth it. You have one life to live. That's it from my perspective, right? And you want to make the most of it. And the most of it is not like getting to a certain place and then coasting. Because I can tell you, like I've retired a couple of times in my life too and that was boring as hell. Um, and you know, Definitely learned later in life that the the lower the lows, the higher the highs. And, you know, that only happens by putting yourself out there and failing and then achieving and then failing. And and that it's, not, you know, I feel bad for people that achieve a certain level of success and then spend the rest of their life afraid of losing it because it really keeps them trapped and it keeps their life small. Um but like I said, that's just the way I look at things and certainly don't prescribe uh, other people think that way unless they feel that way. Uh, what should I consider? Bailey wants to know, what should I consider when transitioning from a one-man band to scaling up and having a team? Great question, Bailey. And there's a lot of ways to look at it. And what you have to be careful of is the mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make where what, what they do is they end up building a team and they find themselves actually working harder and making less. Now, they might be bringing in more money, but they're making less. And I've certainly been guilty of this uh, early on in my career and, and learned a bunch of lessons from that. So the first thing that like if you're bringing on your very first employee, um, what I like to tell people is this. You have to think about 
what is currently stopping you from making more money right now? Is it your time? Like if you had more time, you would be making more money or are you missing certain skills? And if you had those skills, you'd be making more money. So is it more doing more of what you do or is it more of if you had other skills, it's part of the mix, you'd be making more because that's going to determine who your first employee should be. If it's more about you doing what it is that you do, then you want someone to take some of those things off your plate. If it's more, if we had other skills in this business, um, then you want to find someone who's complementary, right? With those skills. And so that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that um, you also, if you can, and I think more often than not, you can, not in every position, but in a lot of positions you can, to bring people in who by their presence make you more money. So a great example of this is I had this um, continuity program called Founders Club. And Founders Club, when it was started, it was started when Todd Brown used to work with me. And I would write a report every other month and Todd would write a newsletter in the months between. As I simplified my business, Todd went off on his own. My right-hand guy, Brian, went to go become the right-hand guy of a billionaire. Mary Ellen Tribby went to go work at Digital Marketer. My team size shrank. And because of that, um, I could no longer spend the two or three weeks writing a report. I didn't have that amount of free time. Uh, I needed to spend more time in the business. And so I ended up hiring a great copywriter and content writer named Chuck Dolce. And Chuck took over the writing of my reports. I worked with him for potentially like three or four days. I'd give him my research. I'd give him my notes. I'd give him my thoughts. We would talk it through. He would tape record it. He'd create an outline. We'd talk that through. And he would write the reports. So I went from spending two to three weeks to two or three days. In addition to that, he was responsible for the growth of Founders Club. That was the name of the continuity program. So I think when he came in, maybe we had like a thousand people in it and he got 5% of the increase in gross. So we had a thousand people, let's say, which was $50 a month. So it was $50,000 a month was coming in from that. I think he grew it to 2000 or some number, right? So he got 5% of that increase. So if he took it to 2000, that was an extra 50,000 a month coming in of which he got 2,500 for and he was a copywriter too So he was now focused on writing the sales letters. He was focused on membership retention And so I made more like forty thousand dollars more within like a few weeks because like we had never really promoted it because no one was focused on it all the time and I worked less and so when you can turn an area of your business into a profit center and then tie someone in to that profit center so that you have less responsibility um, financial responsibility, the better off you are. So I find that at the end of the day, most entrepreneurs build businesses or mistake when they do this wrong, they build businesses where, um, they're the only one at the end of the day that's responsible for bringing in profit. And what I like to do is diffuse that as much as possible. I want as many people as possible in my business responsible for areas of profit because then I've got more people focused on driving the business forward. And I think that's critical. So if you can do that, um, Bailey, that's what you want to do. But that first employee is critical. And you just got to figure out, do you need more time or do you need more skills? And that should dictate your very first hire. So I hope that helps, Bailey. Do, 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 do. Expand your good intentions. I'm not sure what that relates to, Chris, but uh, we are... One and the same, my friend. It's been a long time since we've spoken. I still owe you that day when things clear up or a few hours or whatever I agreed to. Um, uh, we'll do that. I'm a hooker. I hope that's a good statement. I think it is. Uh, generally, don't think of hookers as necessarily good things. Uh, huge. I'm hoping that 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 was related to whether you're getting value from this. Okay. Uh, Gianni. The mental model you shared the other day, little bets, truly inspired me. I tend to make things more complex than they need to be. And the idea of little bets has already helped me to approach new marketing funnels in a different way. How do you usually go about testing new ideas? Do you have a process for that? Thanks, Rich. Yeah, well, it depends, uh, Gianni. So, you know, I've it. sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So first, uh, generally when I have an idea, um, 
I like to bounce it off a few people generally, right? And then I have a few people that I like to bounce ideas off of because they are extremely curious type people and they will make the idea better by just asking me lots of questions about it. So one person that comes to mind is Jay Abraham. So whenever I have a new idea, I generally call Jay because Jay is always curious and he wants to know more. And by knowing more, he pulls out from me a better version of the idea. And so often I'll tape it as well. There now have been ideas, though, that I know are good, that then I don't want to share it with anyone, because I find that when I share the idea, I get if it's a really good idea, I get the psychological payoff of like having done it by just sharing it. You know, it's like I'm so excited to share it. And then the other person's like, oh, that's a really good idea. I feel good about it. And I don't want to feel good about it until I get it done. So and because I've been guilty of that. So, um, so, and then I also have other friends who I would never go to an idea be- with a new idea because they don't sort for the same thing. And they, they would be, I'm thinking of one person in particular, I don't want to share this person's name, but another mentor of mine, um, who, you know, um, he viewed more business as a vehicle to get all the different outcomes that he wanted in life. And so he wanted things that were consistent. And when you know that something works, why do you, why would you go to the next thing until you've exploited the first thing? Whereas like my personality and Jay's personality, we look at ideas and concepts almost like one night stands. Like we, we bring it back to our room. We have our way with it. We dominate it. And then we want to move on to the next thing. Cause that's where it's, where the next exciting dopamine fixes or where the next challenge is. What I've learned over the time is that I have to hand those things off to other people who can continue to grow it so that I don't lose out. Um, but, uh, generally it's that, um, I share it with other people and I, and I gauge their reaction. But first I generally share it with a few people that get the idea better. Um, but I then have, like, if I was going to write a report, a lot of times I, if I, when I was doing a lot of presenting, I would take the main ideas from the report and put it into the presentation. And I would judge by how the crowd was responding and my own feeling, like, could this lead to a sale if I wanted to, or would it be difficult? And there were numerous times where I thought I had a great idea, but when I turned it into a presentation, I realized I'd, I'd be very difficult to sell people now on this. And then I realized that it wasn't as good of an idea as I thought. So I'm always looking for some kind of feedback mechanism, um, whether it's, you know, maybe as I get more comfortable doing more Facebook lives, uh, I'll start using this also as a feedback mechanism. Um, I'm not really sure right now uh, the best way to do that because I don't know that I really get as many people as I'd like to interact with me that are watching. And I think I have to be able to do that in order to use this as a better vehicle. But, um, cause it still is, it's more of a dialogue because people, thank you for everyone who's asking me questions. I appreciate it. Um, but I'd like it to be even more of a dialogue, but I look for the fastest, easiest route. And, uh, Gianni, another thing that like I just related, it's not necessarily to your question, but you know, a lot of people used to come to me, systems and strategy, right? Were like the two things that people thought of me about, um, or I came to mind when people thought of those things. And so people would come to me about systems and they'd want to create a system for something that they've never done before. And I'd be like, yeah, that doesn't really work that way. First, get the outcome. Then we can figure out a system for it. Because why would you go through all the extra effort to make a system to get no outcome? You don't know whether it works or not. Get the result, the sloppy duct tape, you know, ghetto type way. And then when you can get it like where it's all like, you know, taped together, we can turn that into a highly efficient process. But to start by creating a highly efficient process, I just don't think is the best way to go. So I hope that helps uh, Gianni. And uh, yeah, I should get back to these mental models at some point. So I will. Um, But I'm glad that the little bets thing uh, has uh, resonated with you. And if it has, maybe read the book little bets, because all I did was just share that idea from it, you know, um, and you know, it's been a long time since I read it, but, uh, you might get more even from that. Uh, so wing wants to know the bigger, the bigger cause than me, hmm, Duh. scratch, scratch, scratch. Yeah. Like how does, you know, it's like when I take my girls to the beach or when I used to take my girls to the beach, you know, I always tried to pick up like one extra piece of garbage that w- that we were not responsible for. Just one, right? Like not I, like I wasn't cleaning the beach, but just so that the world was a little bit better because we were there, right? 
like ideally at the end of the day, the world should be a better place because you existed. And if you're going to build a business, for sure, the world should be better for some people. Right. And so it shouldn't be that hard uh, to come up with that bigger cause, whether it's just like other people's happiness or other people's enjoyment. You know, I mean, you could look at like Domino's Pizza and you could start extrapolating like what does it mean to be able to order pizza at home and know it's going to come like within 30 minutes well it means the mom doesn't have to spend all her time cooking and therefore or the husband and therefore there's more time to play with the kids and so they're bringing families closer together i mean you can you can extrapolate and as long as it is still believable in your own mind um there's always a bigger cause or there should be and if there isn't then probably some soul searching needs to be done. And that's one of the reasons why I hate, like I just hate people who sell garbage because like, you know, I tell, like I used to have people that wanted my coaching that were like, you know, they want to, they want to create a copywriting product, but they've never written any copy and they're just going to throw some copy stuff together that they learned from a couple of courses. And I'm like, it would be better if you stole people's money. Because at least then they'd still have their time, their hope, and their dream. But when you sell them shit, you're not only taking their money, you're taking their time. If they believe what you say, now they're not only taking their time, they're also going to base their actions on it, which now you're taking their dream. And yeah, like there's, there are so many opportunities to do good things and make money that there's no reason to scam people, to take advantage of people. And, and and yeah, I don't know how people kind of look themselves in the mirror when they, I'm not saying that when that you do that, but it should be easier than you're making it out to be is what I'm saying. Uh, just so you know, even if I miss these live or show up late, I think these live streams are super helpful. Oh, cool, Jason. Well, I appreciate that. Um, very cool. JJ James Lee. Uh, James from Los Angeles here watching through Facebook. Rich, can you share some marketing wisdom on how you would introduce and successfully sell online a premium price program service in an industry with traditionally lower price products and services? I'm in the education market teaching English as a second language. Oh, I've had numerous people who've been in that market. So my prospects are all international. Fortunately, we have a teaching system with a strong USP that fills a gap void in the market. All right. Well, so... You, what you have to do is you have to have a point of differentiation that people will buy into and see why whatever concerns or objections or past experience won't happen. So what I would say is, is like, why, you know, I've done this for too many clients and I don't want to use stuff that I've helped them with. Um, some of them have been on these live streams. Um, but then they've often started other businesses after they made some money in this business, in that business. Um, it really comes down to, you know, why will people get a better outcome? Why will it be easier to get that better outcome? And why will it be faster? And why haven't the things in the past worked that makes your thing work? Um, that's where I would start. I know I'm not giving you a really deep answer there, uh, JJ, and I wish I could, but I, without knowing a lot more from you, I'd have to give you a generic one and I'm finding it difficult to give you a generic one without pulling on the ones that I've already helped other clients create. And I would hate to do something for free, um, that would cause someone who paid me, um, a better competitor. Um, but what I would say is that, um, no matter what program is out there, there are going to be people who have not had success with it. And if you can come up with a rationale as to why that success, why they didn't get the success that way and why that is irrelevant in yours, right? Uh, then you're on the right track. So for example, with the internet business manifesto, and I just like referencing that I could reference a lot of the other reports as well. Um, I showed marketers that getting more marketing was not going to be the solution to making more money. But up until that point, they were doing that. So I could show them that their current gap between what they wanted and where they were was actually caused by being too marketing focused. And so people were now willing to spend a bunch more money on something that up until they kind of heard 
got my perspective on it, they were totally not interested in because like they could see how their efforts in the past were futile and why it would work now. And I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, it went viral and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Charlotte wants to know, what is the BGS program? So that's my original coaching program. Um, that's the one that Ryan Dice went through, Todd Brown went through, Russell Brunson, and all the different people that you've heard that I've coached. Um, yeah, that's my original coaching program. It's uh, Right now, we're not marketing it, um, but we will be shortly. And uh, it's also where you get the opportunity to talk to me personally, like, you know, in a smaller group, just clients, um, every two weeks where we really dive into whatever your issues are and I help you get over them. Um, so it's called the business growth system, BGS, and that's what it is. And then I had another program, which will probably roll out, but not anytime soon called GPS, which was based on theory of constraints. So I taught theory of constraints and that's, it's guided profit systems, like a GPS system, because it shows you the exact point in a business where the current constraint is and how then to eliminate it. So BGS and GPS were my two core products. Uh, Ryan. Hey, Rich. I like that photo, Ryan. You look rather dapper and cool there. Uh, hey, Rich. Got on late and can't stay. Just wanted to wish you well and watch the replay later. Cool, Ryan. I'm glad that you just said hi. Uh, anyone who stops by, uh, I appreciate it. Darn. I missed it. What did you miss? I'm not sure what you missed. Uh, Rich, do you think a free course is a great lead magnet? Also, what are your thoughts about being using a $49 live masterclass as a front end? Do you think that with such a front end product, you can advertise for free and also make a profit on the front end? Uh, not for, well, I guess it depends on the market, uh, Babis, but, uh, is that you bungee jumping? That's cool. I've never bungee jumped. I've always wanted to. Skydiving was so not thrilling. I have a feeling that would be a lot scarier. Um, the, at Agora, uh, we'll sell a $49 newsletter. The average cart value will be somewhere between $100 and $125 with upsells. And we'll spend that plus what we believe we can make in the first six months from the average pros customer. So oftentimes, we will our budget will be an allowable acquisition cost of $250 to make that $49 sale. Now, obviously we're trying to scale in a massive way. So that's one of the reasons, but, um, a $49 product for the most part, if you're selling it to cold traffic, um, you're doing an amazing job if you are at break even. And if you're much higher than break even, then you should be getting more customers if you have more things to sell them after. And you should. Um, the days of making money on a front end are for mo in most niches and industries online are, are gone. Um, that's not to say like, you know, I have friends right now that are making a killing selling masks and things like that, but that's not, that's a totally different game. And then you have to be very good at traffic and you have to be good at other things. So, um, the purpose of the first sale is to create a customer so that you can then have that customer with you for some period of time where now you can increase lifetime value. And, and the more that you're capable of doing that, the better. Now in the beginning, it's hard because like you don't have a lot of money and, and then, you know, you might want to think about having maybe not a front end, but having like a back end that you're using as a front end, um, because it will subsidize a lot more cost or in the beginning, sell a service. Um, so that, you know, you'll still have a cost per acquisition issue, but services generally you can charge a lot more for because it's personalized. And so all of my coaching programs were services, right? A coaching program is a service that I turned into a product by recording everything and then having it turned into a product. But I got paid to create it by pre-selling it through reports and then, you know, launches, then created it, got paid throughout, then had a product to sell after that. Um, a free course could be a good lead magnet, but, um, but what you, but then the course should be short because you don't want to like sell against yourself. Like it's harder to sell someone a bigger course if they didn't finish the smaller course. 
So you want to leave them wanting more. And so, you know, be, the shorter, the better. I hope that helps. Uh, fun, fun, fun. Uh, Erwin. Uh, hi, Rich. Always interesting listening to you. Glad to hear that, Erwin. And thank you for the compliment. Uh, Robert, any and all, you never know where a nugget may be hiding. Uh, okay. Uh, totally fundamental, Rich. You drop a ton of value bombs with each broadcast. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Ecamm experimentation. Yeah. Uh, totally. And, uh, let's see here. Hold on. I wanted to see if I could do this for a second. Let me know. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me hear, do you guys hear like the crowd? <laughs> or the air horn? <laughs> let me know if you heard those two, like if they were loud. Um, um, then I'll play with more sounds. Um, uh, Matthew, I'm new to your show and somewhat to online or to internet marketing. Really enjoying your show, Rich. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, you're in good hands. Uh, I think a lot of people would tell you that. Um, I learned this in the Internet Manifesto. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'm glad you read the manifesto. So thank you, Ryan. Uh Yep, that's me, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right. So, um, yeah, so then the idea there is to, instead of doing that, break up the one project into multiple pieces so you get the feeling of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, but you're just advancing one project. And I think, uh, and like I said, I learned that from Telman. Uh, yes, I got that report, Entrepreneurial Emergency, and learned what you just shared. Okay, cool. Cool, Jason. Yeah, that's where I thought I wrote about it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Tremendously helpful. Cool. Uh, true. Oh, let's see. Absolutely. Cool. Um, true. Most people don't think. Some people think that they think. Lots of people would rather die than think. Yeah, thinking's hard work. Uh, and like I said, if I wasn't writing in my journal, I could spend all day not thinking. Um, it, you know, uh, you can always burn those journals. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't burn them until I die because uh, I do go back to them. And every once in a while, I read, uh, I read them through. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is to, when you've kept journals as long as I have, is that, is how oftentimes, like, you're run, I'm, I've run the same pattern with people, with things in my life that I would have never seen had I not had the ability to go back 25 years and see the patterns, you know, some of these patterns are 10 year patterns, right? I've only been through them like two and a half times, but that was enough for me to be like, oh, okay. I've, I've, I've thought this exact thing 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Like I see where I see this. Um, so yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, the $5 psychologist, AKA the journal. Well, you know, it's even more than that, Hayden. I'd say that most people don't, benefit from their life experience anywhere near as much as they should and the best guru the best psychologist the best whatever it has cannot compare to a long uh to keeping a journal for a long period of time they just can't because they don't have the backstory they don't have the history they don't have what your true feelings were throughout every moment of you know of your life and things change over time right like you know I, I I can relate back to how I felt before I wrote the manifesto because I have my journal entries from there. And so my experience didn't color it later on to make it something it wasn't. Um, and I find that very valuable. You know, it's kind of like my dad was a good storyteller. And over the years, like the stories got bigger and bigger. And I probably am guilty of that too. I think we're probably all a little guilty of that. But when I look back at the journals, like I am at least reminded of the truth. Uh, well, yeah, Ryan, I mean, he said most people can't think, never learned how. And if honest, we all suffer from non-thinking to superficial thinking. Yeah. Well, like I said, thinking is hard work. And so it's taking yourself off automatic pilot. It's like putting all your energy into your like prefrontal cortex, I guess. And, um, if we, we, we wouldn't be able to handle that kind of thinking for really long periods of time. Like, I, I don't remember the stats, but it's like, you know, well, I know the brain is only like 5% of your 
weight if or less or mass and uses up like 20 percent of your calories and a chess champion can lose like seven or to 11 pounds in a day uh playing chess all day um because it's such heavy duty thinking right uh you are doing a great job rich i am impressed with your live streams cool i appreciate that man um i'm trying i, I want to get good at this uh, this is like my next mountain to climb. Uh, Wang, thank you for your honesty. Yeah, you will always get my honest <laughs> answers. You might not like them sometimes, but you can know that at least I'm giving you what I believe to be true. Uh, you are way better than several years ago in this arena or area. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. Um, that's what I'm trying to be. The most honest people on earth, the televangelists. I hope, uh, I hope that's a joke. Uh, at least I think it's a joke. I, I'm going to pretend it's a joke. Um, Dan, got to go, Rich. Thanks for sharing. Uh, look forward to your next one. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, Robert, I'll be here. Are you uh, longer in Florida? Uh, well, I made, a, I made a deal with my girlfriend that I would move to New York because my um, eldest wanted to go to high school in New York. So she graduates this year. And the deal was when she graduates, I moved back down to Florida. So we still have our house in Delray and, um, and we have an apartment in Manhattan and, uh, with Agora, I'm in Baltimore generally a couple of days a week, but since quarantine, I haven't been there. And right now we're in our Hamptons house, but I'm looking forward to not having a place in Manhattan, not having a place in the Hamptons and spending most of my time back in Florida, except maybe in the winter, maybe going way North, um, where it's cold, but I love Delray beach and I can't wait to call that my home again. Uh, Chris, to most people that only change that they like <laughs> in their pocket. This is true. Uh, Carl, Dubcats, I really enjoy your live streams. I'm always learning something. When you talk about making your business fit you, instead of changing yourself, it really resonates with me. It has really helped me get my business back on track. Many thanks for sharing your insights. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the benefits of having your own business. One of your benefits of having your own business is that you make up the rules. You know, and that's there. there's that um, George Bernard Shaw quote. Maybe someone can put it in the text because I'd love to see it. But it's like the reasonable man, like, uh, bends himself to the world. The unreasonable man bends the world to himself. Therefore, all progress relies on unreasonable men. And you could put men and women. I, it was a different time when he said it. Um, but... Uh, Bend the world to yourself. Make the world fit you. Um, if you know the Enneagram, I'm a four. So that could also be an excuse. I think I'm different. So I want the world to bend to me. I don't want to be like everyone else. ADD is probably also a reason. Like I'd like to do things differently. But I just find that like I just don't believe in in sacrificing who you are if you, if you can avoid it. Um... I think this is uh hi rich from tokyo i shared the live to my pages thanks uh miboso you know we also have a um strategic profits in japan at strategicprofits.com for uh strategic profits period jp and uh actually there's a guy that is rich sheffron in japan um who's better looking than me he's taller than me he dresses better than me um, he's a better Richard Sheffron. <laughs> I've gotten to Japan a couple times to speak. Um, and there's always like big crowds there. It's like, I'm a, I'm bigger in Japan than I am in the U S and, um, and I could understand why when I met the rich Sheffron of Japan. Uh, so it was kind of cool. Um, thank you so much for your authenticity. I am so imperfect and I am absolutely okay with it. Yeah. Embrace your weird, right? Like that's what you got to do. That's what makes different is better than better. Uh, at least in the, when it comes to marketing, because you can't appreciate better until afterwards. Different stands out. Oh, making your flaws irrelevant. Is this about hiring out your weaknesses? No, it's not about hiring out your weaknesses. It's about thinking through. It can be though. It's about really understanding what your weaknesses are and designing your business so that that is like not an issue. Right? So I gave the one where like, where, I'm a perfectionist. And so I would, if I had to create a course, I would just never finish. I'd just always be working on it. I'd never feel comfortable, um, pressing done. Right. Um, but there's other areas too. Like I'm not really money motivated. I'm money motivated up to a point when I don't have enough. I'm very money motivated. 
but enough for me is probably less than what many people would think. Uh, I guess it depends where you are in the world, but, um, but not as much as most people would think. And so, um, you know, I had to figure out a way that how could a business keep growing and be focused on profit when the owner doesn't really care once he's making a certain amount. And so things like that. Um, so, you know, it's whatever areas that, uh, you feel that you would need to be better or do better or be different for the business to be successful instead of defaulting to you, then having to be different, be better, be whatever it's, it might be with an employee. It might be with a system. It might be with a process. It might be, you know, there's lots of ways to skin the cat. And, um, you know, sometimes it's obvious a lot, most of the time it isn't. Uh, so a lot of times we've got to get creative. Hope that helps. Um, all right. Hey, Brad from Iowa. Good to have you here. Joe fear fire. I always get his, I always mispronounce his name. Fear. Is it fear or fire? It's Joe fire. Joe is one of the best people in the podcast game and someone who I've learned a lot from and someone who is going to help me roll out my podcast, him and Matt Wolf, his partner. Um, and actually these Facebook lives are also like my training in getting better, uh, at doing podcasts and things like that. And one of the things though, that for me, it's a hundred times easier to sit here and answer questions and have a dialogue than to, um, than to come with, you know, pre-done material. And uh, I also enjoy having conversations. So uh, we haven't forgot, Joe. Uh, it's going to happen. Uh, Oliver, I'm really interested in hearing about the payoff versus trade-off mental models. Does one cancel out the other? Are there special distinctions to focus on? Well, okay. So yeah, let's get back to that for a minute. Um, so it's not that one cancels out the other. It's that, you know, if you're only focused on the payoff and not the trade-off, and, and then what you end up, ha what ends up happening is that you just either fall down in many areas or, um, you run yourself ragged or you fail at everything, or, you know, it's a good skill to have when applied appropriately, but you always have to be cognizant of the trade-offs and, Every, and, you know, it's like the ABC example is a great example of that. Every time you say yes to another project, uh, you're saying later to every project that you've already started, and you're also pushing the payoff further back, which is the trade-off, right? Um, more things can be achieved with focus than anything else. I mean, you can take the sun, right, just regular sunlight, and with a magnifying glass, you can start a fire with it, you know, or burn a leaf or what have you because of that focus. And so being able to say no to lots of things is what's required to achieve success. And what, what most people don't realize is that the more successful you are, the more things you get invited to be a part of, which means that if you don't have that no muscle already somewhat like developed, you will find yourself um, not being able to sustain that success. So, you know, when I was unknown, um, no one was calling me to invite me to events or to do podcast interviews or whatnot, right? Um, when I was really well-known, um, I got invited to that stuff all the time. And if I said yes to them all the time, I would get nothing else done. I'm not as well known as I used to be because I took five years off and that's okay. So now I can say yes to a lot of things because I'm not, you know, a few people invited me onto their podcast from like these live chats. And I was like, yeah, sure. Because I'm not at the point where I've like started to really market myself in a broader place yet. And so I still have that freedom, but most people don't realize that if you don't develop like the focus muscle or discipline early on, you're going to be decimated later. You know, deals get thrown at me all the time. And yeah, I have to say no to the majority of them, which allows me to focus on the few that like I'm like, I believe have the highest probability of success are the ones I think I'll enjoy the most, the ones I'll learn the most 
That's a big one for me. Um, you know, who I'm going to work with. Am I going to enjoy working with them? Are they going to put me just being around them? Do, do I feel excited? Those kinds of things. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, I did want to share another one though, another kind of mental model or distinction. And I was reminded of this, um, last week or the week before, because I was going through the transcripts of this course that I went through a while back. And now I'm going through the transcripts of it, uh, by Tiago Fort called build a second brain. And it's about using Evernote as a place to park really all your research, where you do all your creative thinking, um, where you write, like those kinds of things. Tiago's on another level, and I really appreciate everything that he does. And so uh, he was, you know, he asked people at the beginning of the course to create an outcome. What is the outcome that you want from this course? And uh, so someone asked the question about like, what's the best way to go through the course? And Tiago was picking the person who asked the question. I think his outcome was that he wanted to go through all the material, do all the exercises, get his second brain, uh, fully built up. And Tiago without like, you know, attacking the guy said, that's a really bad outcome because you know, you're turning learning into a fetish. You know, would it be horrible if you only did half the stuff in this course, did only half the homework, but you were writing all the articles that you wanted to write and you ended your days at 3 p.m. instead of 9 p.m.? If you only went through a quarter of the course, but you got that outcome, would that be a bigger failure or a bigger success? And it reminded me of what I have taught for since the beginning of time, like, you know, not <laughs> since I've been teaching and coaching, that being strategic is about using the least amount of input and the least amount of resources to get the maximum payoff, right? Recognizing that there's trade-offs in everything. And so when an entrepreneur asks the question, like, what else can I do? That is the least strategic question that you could ever ask because there's always something else you can do. There's always more, but what you're doing then is consuming more resources. And that's not the best way to get to the best answer. You know, the question is, what's the least amount necessary to get that outcome? And that requires a certain amount of clarity about what the outcome is. And then that opens up another can of worms that maybe we'll, no, we're not going to get to tonight because um, I'm going to be done in 15 minutes. But we can certainly get into that next Tuesday because I really do want to talk about uh, my, I have a unique perspective about goals that I think most people don't. And it came from my midlife crisis that I had in my early 40s that was caused because by the time I was in my mid to late 30s, I had already achieved everything that I wanted to achieve and I wasn't very happy. And then I was like, well, shit, now what? Um, so, but I'll go into the rest of that story in the next live stream. And if I forget, someone can remind me about it. Uh, we will make it happen. The post-pandemic day in Delray. Sounds like a plan, Chris. Uh, that was great. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciated that, Bailey, and I look forward to hearing about your scaling success. Uh, so, Bernard, is what do you want to accomplish with these lives? Uh, what do you want to accomplish with these, with these live achieved for yourself? Right now, it's just more about um, getting comfortable. It's about building an audience. It's about seeing how far I can take it. It's also a way of generating content, although we haven't really started to work on that. Um, so it is a hundred times easier for me to sit here and talk to you and answer questions than it is to sit down and write. And I believe that with the right processes in place, this can be a major source of content. I also want to use these uh, to start posting to, uh, um, to YouTube. I really want to start, I want to create a YouTube channel. Um, but you know, it's like I, but I also see that I am not like, I don't have the same level of, this is what I believe about myself. And I think it's true. I think I'm not being like, I'm not looking for someone to tell me otherwise. Um, I don't have the same charisma that a Gary Vaynerchuk has or Grant Cardone. And I'm wondering how much of that is just time invested versus just genetic who you are. 
And uh, but I know that I enjoy doing live stuff so much that if I was really good at it and I could turn it into a bigger pillar of my business, I would do it and I would really enjoy it. I don't believe right now I am good enough to transcend the people that are interested in the information that I provide. I get that like I know a lot and I've helped a lot of people and I know the information I provide is valuable. But I think that that's where I'm at at this point, that I'm not where I am entertaining to listen to and enjoyable if you're not interested in those things. And I'm not saying maybe that the, the, I see there being different levels to this. I know some of that is just about practice, but it might not be all of it. And so this is a way that started because of the quarantine and so many people were stuck at home to kind of leverage, right? Then to um, boost these posts because we can boost them for like one tenth of a cent or three tenths of a cent to different audiences. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's something that's easy for me to do. I enjoy it. I'd love to be able to be great at it. And if I could get great at it, um, you know, then I might figure out a way to turn it into something more that's like very integral to the business. Um, and I do want to do a lot more video podcasting, um, more long form, you know, uh, not like, like think Joe Rogan, but related to marketers and to the things that I enjoy biohacking and all the different areas, philosophy, um, theory of constraints, all the things that I'm into. And, uh, I'd like to do that. So I see all this as kind of practice for that, seeing what I like, getting used to these kinds of tools, uh, seeing what's really necessary. Uh, so things like that. So I hope that answers your question, Bernard. As I learn more, I will share more uh, what, but that's right now, like it's just to be out there um, and share some of my ideas and get more practice. Uh, to create a name for my Facebook group for realtors, the Closing Machine Group or NLP Realtor, what was the best process to come up with that name? Uh well, I would use the closing machine group because I don't believe that NLP realtor is one who knows if you ever have a problem with Richard Bandler, if he's still alive uh, Two, NLP is somewhat generic at this point. And, and also anybody could teach NLP for real estate, you know, not that the closing machine is that unique either, but I would stick with the closing machine. I, I wouldn't tie yourself to just NLP. That's my advice, Richard. Uh, BB, hi, Rich. Want to clarify on what you just said. I haven't started my business yet. Shall I first start it and get first results and then build the system? My understanding was from the blueprint that I had, I first must design my business in the right way. Well, you want to design your business from, I think you're talking about the business building blueprint. Um, what you want to do is you want to design your business so that it gives you what it is that you're trying to get out of the business while at the same time giving your customers what they want out of their business. So that's the first thing, right? And that, that doesn't have to be done through systems. It could be done just by service and hard at work in the beginning. So I don't see them in conflict. Um, and look, there might be people out there that could advise people on how to design a business without ever getting their hands dirty. I've never done that. I, like I've had plans, but the plans always like, you know, it's like, I think Mike Tyson said, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I've, there's a lot of value in planning, but the plan itself is not where the value is. The plan is useful, but is often going to change. And so I, every business I've ever had, I've had to get my hands dirty and build it. And, uh, and what I thought it was going to be versus what it was are, were often far apart. Oh, I got to change cameras. Well, I'm going to change to this one. Not as beautiful looking, but it will do. Um, let's see if I can change the saturation a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Maybe a little bit too much. Make it a little brighter. And what's gamma? Oh, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I mean. I think you want to design it, but whether you take that design and then turn it into a system or at first try and execute is, is different. A really great book. So I was very into the lean methodology 
And it was kind of a shame that Eric Reese's book became the most popular book because I th of all the books on lean methodology, I felt like his was probably not the best. Um, I'd say that one of the ones that I really enjoyed was a book called Nail It, Then Scale It. And uh, that's all about, you know, building a minimum viable product and, and a business model. You know, the startup of a business is really an experiment. And you're testing the, the, you're validating or invalidating the assumptions that you have about the business. The highest leverage point in a business is the business model, more so than the products, more so than anything else. And so you have a bunch of assumptions about how the business is going to operate, where the customers are going to come from, what they're going to spend money on, how much they're going to like the product, all these kinds of things. And the purpose of the startup stage is not to make money per se, it's to validate or invalidate those assumptions. Because the reason why a lot of businesses fail is because there are false assumptions, but also the reason why entrepreneurs get stuck in a business, unable to grow it to the point where they really hit the level of success that they were hoping for, is also because of some invalid assumptions that were made at the beginning. So you don't want to be stuck in a business, you don't want to have a business that fails, but you also don't want to be stuck in a business like working hard, but never really, but plateauing and never really breaking through. And I don't think you do that unless you're clear on the assumptions that you're making in the business and then get answers to whether those assumptions are correct or incorrect. And if they're incorrect, what is correct? And then how do you change the business model to fit that? That opens up a can of worms. So I don't know that I'm going to, well, I'm certainly not going to have time to do that in the next five minutes, but uh, BB, I'd love to talk more about that with you at some point. So show up on the next live stream and, and we can talk more about it. Just, you know, throw a question my way. Uh, I'm a big fan of business models. I don't think most people have enough of appreciation of like how powerful they are. Uh, Adam said, thank you for saying this, Rich. Okay. My pleasure. I don't know what I said. <laughs> um, oh boy, you just hit the nail right on the head. Okay. I'm not sure. Richard Kent, keep me posted. Hey, Kayvon, good to see you online again. Can you clarify the relationship between core concept and USP, please? Sure, I can do that. Let me just look at what else is here. Uh, oh, they could hear it. Oh, okay, that's what people were saying. Okay, uh, yes, your sound effects are working. Cool, all right, so uh, core concept. Okay, you guys heard all of it. Awesome, you heard the sound effects. Okay, I'm gonna not forget Kayvon, core concept USP. Um, all right, Lonnie. Cool. Thank you. That thank you for letting me know you're going to tune in next Tuesday. Uh, the reasonable man adopts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adopt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on unreasonable men. That's the quote. And I think that that is there's so much power in that. I think quotes are road signs left by the smartest people of the past. All right. Um, oh wow. Okay. I'm not going to even be able to cover all these things. Um, so let me go to uh, core concept and USP because I think this will be helpful for everyone. Um, so, okay, most people have heard of a USP, and if you haven't, it's unique selling proposition. It's like, what is it that you have uh, that makes what you offer different from what everyone else is offering in that difference being a positive difference to the buyer, right? So it's not only a question of being different, but different in a way that means something to the person who's your customer or client. That's what a USP is. And a USP has been taught since Rosser Reeves. He's the one who developed it. Um, he's the one that came up with like belts in your mouth, not in your hands for M&Ms and a bunch of others. And he wrote a book called Reality in Advertising. It's one of the classics of advertising. If you haven't read it, you should. Uh, but it's all about the USP. That's what it's about. And I learned USP from Jay Abraham. He's taught it for years, but, you know, everyone teaches it these days and um, it's valuable and powerful and everything else. Um, what most people don't realize, though, is that when it comes to smaller businesses or most businesses, most businesses have not done marketing prior to the Internet. They did some advertising. That's not the same as marketing. Marketing is very different. Like there has been no other time in history where someone like myself could write a 30 page report and have that report go around the globe like i have clients in all like in almost every country and that couldn't have happened at any other time and some of the biggest corporations in the world couldn't have done that up until before the internet okay and then to be able to communicate with clients around the world all the time is insane 
And so marketing, like the way that we would think about marketing, where you're really helping guide certain beliefs or imprinting on the brain, um, really was not done by most small businesses until recently. And when you think about marketing, um, what, the way I like to think about it is that marketing, like if you if someone asked me to define marketing, and there's a gazillion definitions for marketing, so it's really about coming up with one that you buy into that really guides your thinking. Um, marketing for me is helping prospects value what you offer. That's all it is. Um, there's, you know, I went to one blog page that had like 180 different definitions of marketing. I mean, literally, there is no one definition of marketing. So for me, that's what it is. Helping prospects value what it is you offer. And so when I think about marketing, right, and that could be uh, Facebook Lives, it could be emails I'm sending, it could be uh, reports I've written, what have you, right? Um, these are all things that I'm doing to help people value what it is I offer. And that could be valuing what I offer because of like part of like a coaching program is the coach. So that's me. And then also the ideas behind the coaching program. And so what I've always tried to do is to get, understand my USP, right? And then the core concept is what one belief, if it were true, would make the default decision buying the USP. Like in other words, what one belief, if I could convince people of in my marketing, would make them not only appreciate that one difference in the product, but make that difference the essential difference in the product. I'll give you an example. So when I first released the business growth system, the USP of that was it's the only program that turns opportunity seekers into strategic entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, the internet business manifesto was convincing a bunch of marketers that they were really behaving like opportunity seekers. And what was going to help them break free of that was becoming a strategic entrepreneur. So if someone buys into the core concept, the idea that opportunity seekers struggle and fail and strategic entrepreneurs succeed, then the default decision, if they believe that and they believe they're an opportunity seeker, is by the only program that even makes the claim that it turns opportunity seekers into strategic entrepreneurs. So that's the core concept. Once I know what the core concept is, I then use it to guide everything I do in marketing because I'm also a realist and recognize that the overwhelming majority of people are not going to come across all my marketing messages. If I send five emails, they might only read one. If I create five videos on YouTube, they might only see one. If I do 10 live streams, they might only see one. And so my goal is to have every piece of content that I create in the marketing side of the equation to dovetail into that core concept it doesn't mean i'm going to say it every single time but it has to support that core concept i want every exposure to reinforce that belief and so you know that was for the internet business manifesto the entrepreneurial emergency which taught a course on theory of constraints right i have to make the i have to make the the Ability to discover what your constraint is, the most important thing. That's what I have to do. So the core concept there is that potential, your level of success does not equal your potential. Your level of success is your potential minus your constraint. Most of the things you currently are doing are adding more potential. They're not adding more success. Why? Because it doesn't change the current constraint. And if I can convince people of that, then they need a course to figure out what their constraint is. And so therefore, everything I did during that campaign was about that. So I hope that helps. So the core concept really is the one idea that you need to get your prospects to believe so that when you are trying to make the sale and pushing them out of their status quo, they already believe that the difference that they need is the difference you provide. And so that's the core concept, as at least as I developed it. I wrote a report on that too. That's a, one of the paid reports, like the Hidden Obstacles report. It was one of those founders reports. Uh, and, uh, Kayvon, you should have access to that. And if you don't let me know and I'll send it off to you or when we talk, I'll send it off to you. Um, no, I agree, Tom, that I want to be me. I just want to be a better version of me. Uh, <laughs> that's true. I don't want to be either of those guys. Um, but I do want to be better. And, you know, um, 
And what I mean by that is that, like, well, I've known Gary forever, right? Gary used to speak at my events back in 2008. I, I know you know that, Tom. But, like, I, I went into – so Grant is in the same division of Agora that I'm in. And we had a division kind of, like, event where all the financial gurus spoke. And I went in there not wanting to like Grant. Like, I just didn't want to like him. I don't know why. I heard things about him. Maybe I was jealous or envious. I don't know. But I went in there not wanting to like the guy. And he's so he was so charismatic on stage. And it felt like so good that I like he won me over during that presentation. So I went in not liking him and I went out liking him. And uh, yeah, I want to have that ability. I want to have that ability. Not the way he does it, not the way Gary does it, but the way I'll do it. And I don't know how that is. So, guys, I'm late for my next call. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank you for the likes. I want to thank you for the shares. I want to thank you for the questions and the feedback. Um, it really makes it so much easier to talk to you guys when you're throwing questions my way and letting me know uh, how these different ideas have impacted you or thoughts you've had. I just want to really say from the bottom of my heart that uh, I appreciate that there's a lot of things you could be doing during the two hours. There's so many things that you could be watching, reading, doing. And so I don't take it for granted that you decided to spend whatever time you were here with me. And I appreciate you for that. And I look forward to talking to everyone on Tuesday. And until then, to Higher Profits Beyond. Oh, one last thing. Uh, to Higher Profits Beyond, I was going to say Sheffern over and out, which is what Ryan, whoever, the American Idol guy, when he did it, uh, used to say. Um, but... Uh, for those of you who are still here, if you're not a member of our Facebook group, you should join. Uh, we don't even ask you your email address. We're going to change that at some point, but we're not going to like, it's just a great place. We have a ton of uh, conversations going on. It's highly engaged and uh, we'd love to have you all there. So uh, thank you all. Sorry I didn't get to all your questions or even to put up your comments. But I do appreciate it, and I will be looking at them all later. And so if I didn't answer your question, I will keep it going forward. And I just want to say thank you again until then, until Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, have a wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll post uh, we'll post the uh, post about the video coming, I mean, about the next live stream on Monday or Tuesday, the latest Tuesday morning, if not Monday. So till then. Adios, higher province and beyond.